Welcome. So I'm really delighted to have this discussion about virtual reality uh, and maybe a few other things with uh, Michael and Mark. But first, for those of you who might not know uh, Michael, let me tell you a bit about him. He's a legendary figure in the programming and gaming communities as a wise dispenser of coding, a great developer, and an expert in exotic technologies. Maybe we'll get into one of those uh, tonight. Um, one of his first uh, games was on the IBM PC. It was a clone of Space Invaders. He's played key roles at Microsoft and id Software, where he teamed up with John Carmack to do Quake, which stole millions of hours from the lives of young men. And uh, when he was hired by Oculus, a young virtual reality company, it was a big deal. And now he's the chief scientist of Oculus and the head of Oculus's top secret Seattle research lab. Uh, our other panelist uh, is Mark Zuckerberg, who's the CEO and founder of Facebook which is off to a pretty good start in connecting everyone in the world with about 1.5 billion users now. And recently, a billion of those users signed on on the same day, which is kind of mind-blowing. Uh, Mark and Facebook came to virtual reality by buying Oculus for about $2 billion. And it, the uh, long-awaited Oculus Rift headset, which we have one here, is going to come out in the first quarter of next year. But before I talk to them. Let me ask you folks, let me pull the audience here. How many of you have experienced virtual reality? Can I see hands there? Wow. Well, probably more than normal. It's funny, the front of the audience gets a little more than, than, the, than the back there. I don't know what that means. But uh, that, that, that's, that's pretty good. But a lot of people are still to be uh, indoctrinated there or, in, uh, or exposed. But let me start with you, Mark. Why did you buy Oculus? Well, every 10 or 15 years, uh, there's a new computing platform that comes along, right? So there's, uh, you know, there used to be you know, mainframes and then PC and then uh, on top of apps there was the web and then there's mobile and there's, there's kind of always the next thing. So there are two big trends that, uh, that we looked at here that were important for, for our mission of, of connecting the world. Uh, the first is this trend towards um, just more immersive and intuitive computing platforms, like I was just saying, right? So, you know, we started off, we, we had these mainframes. You, you basically needed a degree to be able to even use a computer. Um, you know, and it got easier over time. You got PCs where it got a little more natural than, you know, you, were, you had a mouse, you were moving something over here to control something over there. People could broadly use it, but, um, but it wasn't super intuitive. Mobile is the first platform that is really natural, right? You're directly manipulating it, and it's not a coincidence, I think, that it's uh, the first widely beloved computing platform, but it's not the end of the line, right? I mean, these platforms will keep on getting uh, more immersive and more natural, and, and I think that there are a lot of reasons to believe that the next uh, major computing platform is gonna be connected to, uh, more directly to, to vision. And, um, you know, if you think about phones, they do a lot uh, really well, but, and it's still a little bit awkward to take it out of your pocket when you want to interact with it. It's not that immersive. Um, it's nice, you know, to be able to scroll through stuff directly, but, you know, in the future, if you want to look around, you should just be able to kind of look around, right? If you want to select something, you should kind of just be able to look at it. And I think that that's the direction that that's going. Uh, there's another direction, or another important trend for, for sharing, which is that with technology, what we see over time is that uh, people are getting richer and richer tools to express themselves and to experience uh, content on the internet. So if you look back maybe 10 or 15 years, most of what people shared and experienced on the internet was text, right? And then we, we kind of have gone through this period where, you know, from about five years ago on, uh, most of the content is visual, right? So whether it's direct photos um, or in the stories that people produce, photos play a big role, that's an, an increasing part of it. And, um, now I think we're really entering into this golden age of video online, where that's becoming the primary way uh, that people share and consume content online. But I don't think that that's the end of the line, right? I mean, there's always uh, a more immersive and, and richer way that you want to experience things. And at the end of the day, video is just this 2D format where you know, you're looking at it through a small window. And um, I, I don't think that that's uh, the, the ultimate in, in human experience that we want to share. You know, I mean, it, we're, uh, my wife and I are having a, a, a baby sometime soon, you know, and then I, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to um, being able to capture not just a, a photo, right, of her first steps or a video, mm -hmm. but really kind of capture that moment and, um, and be able to share that with her family mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, all, the, all our other close friends and, and have them have the ability to actually be there, right, and, and, and feel it and, and see what it's like 
um, not just in a still photo or a 2D video, but that. So I think that that's why this is so exciting. Every 10 or 15 years, there is a new major platform that comes mm -hmm. along. I do think virtual reality is going to be that with augmented reality. Um, and the Oculus team are just the best folks that are years ahead of everyone else in terms of building this. And um, it's really exciting and an honor mm -hmm. to work with them on this. Well, videos and photos and, other th and you know, the, the visual side of it and certainly the tech side of it were things that we all had before. Virtual reality is something we've, we've never had before. What was your moment where you thought, oh man, this is the next platform. This is the next step beyond these things that we've brought into the internet, like watching videos and, and pictures and, and, and things like that. Well, a lot of things in technology just come down to um, cost and power, right? And uh, when things get, get powerful enough for everyone to uh, be able to participate in them. So like you're saying, you know, we've had TV for a while, but it hasn't been uh, too long that everyone has had the ability to create videos and share what they've wanted. That's only really been something that we've had with the internet. And um, you know, a lot of the trends that I think uh, allow virtual reality to exist now and become mainstream um, are that the, the technology um, is progressing, right? So you have Moore's Law progressing, and the, the cost is coming down. And I mean, this is really your area. So I mean, me talking about this with you next to me is kind of a joke. Um, but, um, but I mean, one of the main things that, you know, I've thought that this would exist for a while. The, the real shock to me was when I went down to visit the Oculus folks uh, in the, the original office was in Irvine, uh, California. The, the thing that, that I realized was not, okay, this is a thing, but okay, this is a thing now, because you can produce this experience with a normal kind of screen that you'd find on a mobile phone, right? So now you don't have to invent some new exotic screen in order to make this um, possible. You can just use the stuff that there are already big assembly lines and, and uh, manufacturing capacity spun up to produce these things at reasonable cost. And now the technology exists so you can use that to at least deliver the first generation and that, that's now possible. Mm -hmm. So these things that I think people have thought should exist for a while are now uh, capable of, of happening. But I mean, you, you should yeah. probably go into more detail on, on all that. Yeah, well, I, I want to ask Michael, and, and, you, and you're, ref, you're referring to that, it, it, it's, it's time now. You know, this is not our first time around the block with virtual reality. Uh, I actually wrote a story for Rolling Stone about virtual reality in 1990. And that was uh, a couple of years before the inventor of this thing, um, you know, Palmer Lucky, was born, really. Uh, why, why, why now, Michael? Is it just simply a matter of Moore's Law, or were there some breakthroughs that happened? And, you know, wh why are we seeing this little boomlet in, in virtual reality uh, at this moment? Well, Moore's Law is definitely a huge part of it. Since you wrote that article, we have something on the order of a million to 10 million times the calculation capability. And when you have to draw the world in real time at 90 hertz in stereo, and when you have to track the world and analyze what's there and keep yourself stable, it's all about calculations. So it was, in a sense, it was impossible then to do something that could possibly be a consumer part. Another thing is the cell phone industry, because if you think about how many billions of dollars were invested in getting to those screens, there's no way that you could have justified it to start up the virtual reality industry. But now that they're here and you can prove that it's viable, it can bootstrap itself from this point forward. The final thing is, I think that there's a generation of people who have grown up with science fiction and movies that tell them that this is actually possible. And once the technology hit that point, it was immediately apparent to people. I mean, it was obvious to you once you saw it, we're here, right? And that's happened with a lot of people. Once you put it on and have that experience, which I guess about half of you have, you never look at it the same way again. People, sometimes they say, wow, that was really incredibly cool. And sometimes they say that was almost a religious experience. But they know that things have changed. And because of that, there is now this commitment. The fact that Facebook is committed to virtual reality and committed to the fact that it is going to take time to develop this technology and ramp it up, that they're investing in the research that we're doing, that really makes a difference because virtual reality now has the runway to become truly successful. Well, I'm glad you mentioned science fiction because in talking to people who are making this happen, they were all shaped by you know, science fiction. Is, are we going to get that experience like you know, we're in there and have these superpowers and it'll be feeling literally like we are there? For me, the defining moment, the moment in which I truly believed in virtual reality was the first time I looked over a virtual ledge and my knees just locked up and I backed away from the edge of it. And I'm wearing this thing on my head, I'm in a room, someone's talking to me, I know, I, I can't, so actually, I don't know if Mark knows this, but the walls of the pit that I was looking at were lined with a 
page from Yahoo announcing Facebook was about to go public. <laughs> that just happened to be the one someone had pulled off the web and slapped up there. Nothing about it looked realistic, except that everything moved the right way, and that was all it took to kick in those low-level systems and say, no, this is real, you are, you're in an emergency, you're in danger. So we can actually produce those now, and for those of you who have had the demo, the Oculus demo does have a scene where you look over a ledge and you can have that experience. So we already have pieces of that. On the other hand, there are huge numbers of pieces of that that are gonna take years, decades of research and development to get to. And a good example is that while we can look over an edge and give you that vertigo, give you that sense of height, in order to leap from one building to another, we need to give you a sense of acceleration as well. And we need to give you a sense of haptics as you take off and land. And to give you that sense of acceleration, we would need to stimulate your vestibular organs, which are located inside your skull, which creates a real problem unless you're willing to go through surgery. So <laughs> that one, right now, there's not really any traction on it. There's some potential ways we might approach it, but solving problems like that is going to be a long time. So we'll have pieces and we can give people compelling experiences now. Mm -hmm but there are a lot of compelling experiences that will come up as time goes on. And you're one by one taking on those issues in, in your research lab, aren't you, to make all that stuff happen? I don't know about the brain stuff, but... So our, uh, our research lab is looking five to 10 years ahead. I mean, you can't really look you know, 20 or 30 years ahead, but we're looking at how you get those, those quantum jumps getting to the next level in the experience, because as you're working on a product, you really can't think five years ahead. You just don't have that option. And so we have a research facility that is dedicated to that long-term research and development to get VR down that road to that future. And again, it's Facebook's investment that's made this possible, and that commitment really does make a huge difference. Going back to the, uh, the Matrix video, though, you know, the, the mission that the Oculus team has is to empower people to experience anything. And, um, you know, one of the recent experiences that, that I had, which is was really mind-blowing for me is, you know, we just got the hands working, right? So, um, so when, when I originally uh, got to know you guys, it, we, you had the, the, the vision starting to work. And, and again, going back to the question about why now, um, it's not like this is some far off thing. I mean, you'd already shipped like 100,000 dev kits at you know, low hundreds of dollars. So yeah, I mean, a dev it, kit is you know, the, 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 the yeah, rig so. that you give to people writing, writing software for it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, why now? I mean, it's a, a lot of people are already kind of starting to, to build with this and at a reasonable uh, low price, not something super expensive. So you have the vision working, but, you know, your first experience is you go in and you're like, okay, this feels real. And then you try to do something with your hands and you're like, ah, where are my hands, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that freaks you out. So now, um, I guess you, you have yeah. the hands um, here. I mean, it's a really kind of ergonomic um, feeling thing. It's just a loop. And um, so, I mean, you can, you can kind of let it go in your hand. It, it's not something that you have to hold for, for, um, for a while, and, and you can use it for a while. And um, there's this really trippy experience where uh, there's this demo where you go into it, and there's someone in another room somewhere else who, who's in it, and there's this uh, kind of table of, of stuff, and you can just pick it up and throw it around. You can juggle with right. a person. And one of the things that you can do is pick up a ping pong paddle and start playing ping pong. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, okay, it feels like the person is right there, and you see them, and, uh, and you feel like you're interacting with them. And I'm like, all right, this is, this is really awesome. But then the next thing you can do is change gravity in the room. Mm -hmm. So you can um, simulate either you're in space where there's no gravity or zero gravity, and you're playing ping pong in these different conditions. And you can, you're underwater with water um, tension and friction. And um, you know that, to me, is kind of like the Matrix clip that you showed, where it's, um, you know, there are all these different variants on how the world could be that it's really hard to imagine what that is like except intellectually. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, when you can actually viscerally feel that and exist in that world, I think that's going to unlock uh, all kinds of new possibilities. Is this the way people are going to use Facebook in the future? When I use Facebook, Am I going to go in some sort of virtual world, some sort of metaverse, and instead of chatting with someone, I'm going to be in the room with them? I think we'll ease into that. <laughs> so, you know, so I mean, one of the things that we just launched was 360 videos uh, in Newsfeed. And so the idea is that instead of just a, a, a 2D video where you're looking at the screen, um, you can now kind of pan around. And you can do that. Um, I don't have my phone on me, but basically, I mean, you can, you can like, move it around in the room and see different parts of, of the scene. It's, it's pretty neat. I mean, that sets us up very well to, in the future, be able to uh, use a headset and be able to look around that way, too, and have it be more immersive. So, you know, what, what Facebook is is a way to give people 
a, a voice to share anything that they want in, in any form of, of medium um, with any audience that they want. So certainly, this more immersive content will be an increasing portion of what gets shared, and people, I think, will go in and out of, of wanting to share that content and consume it in that way. Um, but another part of the beauty of, of um, internet communication is it's asynchronous, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there are going to be use cases where you can be in person and doing something with someone like playing ping pong or, um, I don't know, a doctor doing or surgery remotely using virtual reality. Uh, that you very much need to be synchronous. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think for a <laughs> lot of um, very synchronous and yeah. very low latency, uh, which, which we're getting to. But, um, but I think for a lot of the stuff, you, there will continue to be a lot of value unlocked by allowing someone to capture a moment, uh, put it on the internet, for the people who they want to share it with, and then allow, allow those people to have the power to consume that at any time it makes sense. Um, you know, so going back to the example before of you know, baby photos or in the future baby mm. scenes or whatever it is called when, when that becomes a thing, um, you know, a lot of the beauty of that is not that it has to be kind of live streamed to your, your parents um, across the country or, wh or wherever they are, but that you can take that and, it, and it's a piece of content, you can send it to them and then they can experience the, the first steps um, when it's convenient. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I mean, it is a, uh, you bought it, you say, as a platform there. And uh, Michael, I think you've called it the last platform, right? You know, virtual, virtual reality there. And is this going to be like something, like when mobile came up, you said everything at Facebook has to be mobile first. We're in, you know, do you envision a day where not only Facebook, but other companies will say, we have to be virtual reality first in, in what we do? Maybe, but I mean, this is, I think, one of the important points that, that Abrash was just making is that you know, these things take a while to happen, mm -hmm. right? So the first smartphone uh, came out in 2003, right? I think it was the, the BlackBerry uh, and Palm Trio came out in the same year. And I don't think either of them shipped even a million units in the first year. And it took about 10 years to get to a billion units. Right. And it was around that time when there were about a billion units out in the world where I think then a lot of companies really started making it their primary thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a curve that's very similar to that with VR and AR, where you know, there's, there's a lot of hype, a lot of people are really excited. Um, in the first year, you know, I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, this might be millions of units. I mean, I think look at, look at smartphones um, and, and kind of how that developed for, for how you, you're going to see this curve. And you know, maybe sometime 10 or 15 years from now, when there are a billion uh, of these out in the world, uh, then companies will be talking about having that be the primary thing that they're developing for. But in the meantime, I think the bigger market that we're going for is that there are 250 million people who have Xboxes, Playstations, and Wiis, mm -hmm. right? So that in, in kind of gaming, and then once you start building uh, the base so that way um, there's a large set of people who are using this, then you're going to get video and all kinds mm -hmm. of interesting content that, that can go to that base. That's, I think, where this is going to start. And it'll be quite a while, I think, before it becomes a mature right. platform in the way that smartphones are today. It's remarkable to hear you talk this way, because several times you referred to the long horizon before this reaches fruition there. And I remember it wasn't too long ago before you were saying, well, you know, there it goes. Uh, Actually, normally they have a little strap there to make sure you, you don't I drop know. it. I just broke it. <laughs> you better talk to uh, the manufacturer there. Uh, but uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago when you were saying, wow, we did something really amazing at Facebook. We spent six months uh -huh. on a project there, and that's so different for us. Now you're talking about five years, 10 years. Is this sort of a shift in your general way of thinking as Facebook becomes bigger and your plans have become more ambitious? Yeah, well, we went through this shift a few years ago when we reached a billion people. Uh, and you know, f since almost the beginning of the company, getting to a billion people, building a community of a billion people was this moment that we were rallying around. And it was just, you know, I remember Dustin, my co-founder, uh, wrote about how one day we'd get there, and everyone was kind of like, no, that's crazy. And that was all that we can imagine. If, if we could do that, then that would be amazing. And, I guess it, it is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you actually get there, you realize, hey, you know, the mission of a billion is kind of an arbitrary number. Uh, it's a nice round number, but it's a little arbitrary. The, the real mission that we have is to uh, connect everyone in the world and give them the, the power to share and experience everything that they want. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that there are a lot more fundamental challenges that we need to take on in the world that you can't just do in a six-month period. Mm -hmm. So for example, the majority of the people in the world aren't on the internet, right? If you really want to help everyone in the world connect, you need to solve that problem. And um, 
that's not something that you can do in uh, a hackathon or a six month sprint or something like that. That requires changing very fundamental assumptions about how the world works and how the economics of entire industries work. And um, that's something that we're committed to because that's our mission. But I think if you look at that over a 10 year period, you can make a pretty big dent in some of these things that, uh, that change underlying assumptions about how the world works and um, you know, what the next computing platform is, AI, um, connectivity are a few of the big areas that I, I hope we can make that kind of an impact in. Right, well you, you brought up connecting the rest of the world. There's been you know, a little controversy about you know, uh, your internet.org and you just changed the name of that because some people say that by offering uh, Facebook in a, a free manner you know, and, and not other stuff, it uh, violates net neutrality and sort of mixes self-interest with the idea of connecting all the world there. You know, what, what's your response to that? Um, well, I think it, it helps to take a step back for a second. So, you know, I think internet connectivity and providing access to everyone is one of the fundamental challenges of our generation. Right? In the US, when we think about the internet, a lot of what comes to mind is entertainment and communication. But it's easy to lose track of the fact that for a lot of people, uh, the internet also provides vital information around um, health care that they might not get access to or, or information around otherwise, uh, education that they might not have good access to, um, jobs and, and job listings and, and, and ways to work that they might not have uh, otherwise access to. So it's not surprising that there's data that suggests that for every 10 people who get access to the internet, uh, about one person gets lifted out of poverty and about one new job gets created. So there are four billion people in the world who don't have access to the internet. So I mean, if, if you, if, if you kind of look at that data, this is one of the fundamental things that we need to do in this generation, which is going to have a very large impact, positive impact on the world. So you know, it's not an easy problem. right? There are a lot of ways that you, that you need to go about solving this. And um, we're working on a number of them. Now, a, a lot of what people think about, for when you think about why don't four billion people have access to the internet, a, a lot of people go to, oh, well, um, you know, there isn't the right infrastructure or technology to serve people. It turns out that 90% of the world lives within range of a 2G or 3G signal. So you have a phone, you can pick up a signal. So you know, there are about a billion people or so um, for whom we're going to need to invent uh, all kinds of new you know, solar powered planes and satellite technology and all that stuff. And, and we're doing that, right? Because that, it's important to reach the last billion people too. But that's not the biggest challenge. Um, the, the real challenge is actually that, uh, and this is the majority of people who are not online fall into this bucket, that they often didn't grow up with a computer and they've never used the internet. And if you ask them, do you want to buy a data plan, uh, their answer is going to be, uh, why? Uh, they, they actually they have enough money to afford it, but they're not sure why they would want it. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that actually seems pretty simple, but it requires a business model innovation, which is making uh, the internet something where you can use some services for free, mm -hmm. right? Some basic services that don't consume a lot of bandwidth and um, and, and resources, right? So you know we all know that stuff like video and high-res photos and app mm -hmm. installs. You know, consume a thousand or ten thousand times more data than just kind of consuming right. some text. But you can deliver stuff like basic health information, um, education information, Wikipedia, um, basic communication, um, stuff like that, for almost no cost. And what we found is that by doing that and and kind of making that free, uh, people find very quickly so that they now have access to that. And then within a month, uh, more than half of people who get access to those services realize why the internet is valuable and become paying customers. Well, how, but how do you do that, you know, if Facebook is one of those companies giving course, other folks and, a and, shot and too? And it has to be because if you ask people in the developing world, uh, Facebook is the number one reason why a lot of people get access to the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the, you know, it makes sense. Without data access, um, you can already call the people that you want right, with a voice plan or text them. Um, staying in touch with people is the most fundamental thing that people do. Mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, it's not a surprise that after being able to call people and text people, the next thing that people want to do is be able to keep in touch with everyone they care about at once. So you know, the, this model, you know, we actually don't mandate that Facebook is a part of, of Free Basics, which, you know, by the way, is that we have this internet.org program which is doing all these things, right? So there's technology development, there's the solar powered planes, the satellites, the laser right. communication, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Space program. Um, yeah. And then there's the business model innovation. Yeah, we just announced that we're, we're doing satellites this week. 
Um, and then there's the business model innovation, of which there are a couple of things as well. Free basics is one of them. That's mm -hmm. the one that um, the controversy is right. public. It turns out actually basically everything impactful that you want to do has some controversy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that um, it turns out that uh, the, the media here is, is we're a little less focused on um, the debates around you know, whether you should be able to send a satellite signal down to the ground from a satellite which is not built in that country. Right, which is actually, those are laws that exist in many countries that um, made it so that we started our satellite program in Africa instead of some of the other countries. But it, it, I think it mostly turns out that anything that you want to do that's going to change um, business models will encounter some debate, rightfully so. The net neutrality stuff, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, net neutrality is a really important principle. And um, this is an area where I think the US and, and the regulations that we put in place um, really got it right, which are strong net neutrality provisions, but making it very clear that companies can, can uh, work on different business models to provide access in different ways. And um, you know that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, there's a very long legal history um, across the world where you know, price discrimination mm -hmm. is bad, right? So if, if you want to um, say, you know, I'm gonna, I, I sell apples, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to sell apples to white men for a dollar and black women for $2, um, that is wrong and is rightfully banned, right? And, and net neutrality, I think, is, is kind of like that. It's like saying, look, like, if, if, the, um, if a, an operator wants to advantage their own video program and charge more for Netflix, then that is bad. Right, and I think that, that, that is, it's good that that is the, right. the, the law and the regulation. But at the same time, if, um, if the person who's selling the apples wants to donate some to a food bank for free, um, there's never anywhere where there's a law against that. Right, and, and it's, it's kind of pretty easy to see why that's the case, right? Because if you're trying to access Netflix, um, you know, I mean, you can see who's getting hurt by that violation of net neutrality. If you're a student in India and you are uh, getting access to some basic tools to be able to uh, do your homework for free, and um, you can learn some more, then it's, it's really hard to see how that um, is hurting anyone. And I think that that's something that we need to be fighting for. If we do fight for that, then I think that the, the stats that we have suggest that we can lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Okay, I want to come, come back. Okay. <laughs> they like it. You mentioned augmented reality a, a couple times there. You know, and that is, you know, uh, unlike virtual reality, which takes over all your senses, uh, puts a layer of you know, digital information that sometimes looks like real life uh, out in front of you. Is Facebook working on augmented reality? Yeah. But th this, again, is in, in Abrash's. Well, um, Michael, can you tell us? Knowing more than ours. So, I, I just the boss just said OK. It's a bit further out. But I mean, yeah. So AR is obviously very interesting. It's something that we would all use today if it worked well. And it's kind of seamless with virtual reality in the sense that 20 or 30 years from now, you just have a pair of glasses on. Or maybe there'll be contacts. Who knows? But you'll have something on. And you'll just be able to be in virtual or augmented reality as you choose. But right now, the technology for virtual reality is past the knee of the curve. It's at the point where you can have experiences that really feel genuine. And that's the unique thing about virtual reality. AR is harder. There are a whole host of challenges having to do with how you do the optics and displays to get photons into the eyes, with how you track in novel environments, with how you have something on your face that is comfortable for all day, socially acceptable, has enough power. There are just a lot more challenges there. I think virtual reality is here now. I think AR will be here, but it's a long road to get there. OK, well, um, we're going to start uh, opening the mics up to, to questions there. Well, while that happens, I have a, uh, also a question about uh, augmented reality there. Facebook does uh, face recognition there. Can I imagine a Facebook in the future where I can see my friends? Maybe so I, sometimes I have people on my friends list who well, actually I've never met. You know, and it, you know, it could recognize the face and say, hey, there's that person there? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is. One of the big things that we're working on for the future is, is um, artificial intelligence. And our goal is to build computer systems which are better than people at, at all the perceptual things that people do, right? So vision, uh, hearing, language understanding, um, kind of understanding concepts, memory. Um, and I think we can get there within five to 10 years. Now, I mean, importantly, that does not mean that we're going to have computers that are smarter than people. Um, what it does mean is that we will have computers that can do the basic human sensory work better than people. So for example, we have this effort 
um, safety check where, you know, whenever there's a, a hurricane or an earthquake around the world, we, um, we try to make sure that we right. can rally our community to, to help uh, the relief effort of the people there. So, uh, I mean, just recently in, in Nepal, you know, our community rallied together and raised more than $15 million um, for, for the relief efforts. And also, uh, basically, people can either mark themselves as safe or uh, mark their friends as safe, and then it notifies all their friends, which, I mean, if, if you've ever had a, a loved one who's in a, a disaster like that, like, the only thing you want to know is that the people that you care about right. are, are safe. Mm -hmm. In the future, you know, so right now, it's, it's, that's probably the best we can do is, is um, making it so that people can easily mark themselves as safe or the people around them, and then we notify people. In the future, we're going to be able to have things where you have um, a computer that can look at a scene and figure out better than a human could um, where the people who are who need help, who who maybe those people are, um, notify people m more naturally um, of the people who are safe or the people who are in danger. And I just think that that stuff is going to be awesome. So right. yeah, we're we're working on that vision, um, hearing, language, um, a lot of obvious applications. Uh, you know, I mean, even today, we have we have object. Recognition to the point where if you're a, a, a blind person using Facebook and you know so much of Facebook is visual, you can go through feed and you can tap on a photo and, um, and we can read out to you what's in the photo. Hmm. So I mean, this is two people and they're doing this activity. Right. And I mean, I think that that's a really important thing to make sure that everyone gets included in the sharing that's, that's going on. And certainly as, as AI tech advances, there will be more and more of, of, of that kind of thing. Terrific. So let's take a question up here. Um, Mark, you mentioned that the, um, the Oculus needs to be hooked up to an Xbox in order to get the rendering capabilities so that you can get the full experience, right? But I guess there was a real inflection point when Oculus released the Gear VR with Samsung. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is, do you foresee that Oculus is moving in a direction where it's going to be pure mobile so that it's available to all the masses, or are you sticking more to sort of the gaming community? I mean, so yeah, it's definitely going in the direction of working through any computing device. It actually doesn't work with Xboxes today. The point that I was making was that the initial market that we're going for is going to be uh, a lot of people who love gaming. The 250 million people who own an Xbox, PlayStation, or Wii today will probably be the first people who will buy an Oculus and plug it into their computer, or buy a Gear VR and plug it into their phone to use it. Um, you know, initially, Abrash was talking about this stuff a bit. I mean, this is really computationally intensive stuff. So, you know, today it works on the highest end devices, but, you know, one of the beautiful things about the technology industry is you get Moore's Law. So today's high-end devices are tomorrow's all devices, and um, we get to ride that wave, and without having to do too much of that work ourselves, we'll do different work. Um, I do think we'll get to a point in, in a few years where we will be able to um, power this stuff, uh, maybe a few years is too soon, but five years or whatever it is, where you can power this stuff off of um, basically any mainstream computing device that someone would have. Great, right, thank you. This mic here. Mark, um, it seems like the, as I go onto Facebook these days, more and more of my news feed is being crowded out by advertising, and it's reducing the utility of the, um, of the service to me. Are you worried at all that somebody's going to come along with a neutral platform that doesn't try to monetize and that as people get more and more sick of advertising, they're going to flock to it? Uh, no. And, <laughs> you know, look, our, our mission is to connect everyone in the world, right? And if you want to do that, having a free service is really important. And it turns out that uh, running one of the world's biggest internet services or, or the world's biggest internet service is an expensive thing to do, right? We have many data centers, hundreds of thousands of servers, thousands of people work on this. Uh, it doesn't pay for itself, right? So, you know, it, we need a business model, and if you want to make your service free, so that way everyone in the world can use it, um, advertising is by far the, the best uh, way to do that. Now, in addition to that, what we basically find is that we measure the quality of the ads and track it against organic content. And what we find is that we're actually making very significant progress towards uh, the ads basically converging with a lot of the organic content um, in terms of the quality. Now, different buckets of content kind of have different characteristics, right? So your friend's content may not have quite as high production value, but is more emotionally resonant because it's someone who you care about, um, whereas kind of organic, uh, publicly created content that you're following is going to have 
um, more mass appeal and higher production value. But one of the things that we're seeing on the, the business side is you know, there are now more than 40 million businesses who have an active presence on Facebook. And you know, there's a, a limited number of slots that we show ads in. So actually, there's more competition for those, which means the higher quality ads get shown to people more. And that, including, that, that kind of pushes towards um, the, the quality of the ads getting higher and higher. So all of the, the things that we measure um, suggest that this is working quite well, and that I think we're going to reach the point in the not too distant future where even if it were possible to kind of I don't know, crowdfund a social network or something at the scale that we're talking about. Um, I still think, I actually think we were going to get to a point where the ads will be a meaningful addition to the experience and will add different content um, where people will actually start to view that as a positive. And we actually do in a number of countries. The, the US is, is not one of those today, um, but there are, are plenty of countries where the ad content is basically at the level in quality that people prefer to the organic content that's there. And um, I, I think that we're basically converging on that everywhere. Well, next question. Hi there. Uh, my name is Blake Menezes. I'm a student at the University of San Francisco. Um, and I had two questions, one for Mark, one for Michael. Uh, the first question is, as Facebook has continued to roll out products like the 360 video, um, different types of video, uh, a way to, for publishers to actually write on there with uh, renewing Facebook notes and all these different mediums, um, how do you see Facebook growing as a publisher if it continues to head in that direction where publishers can share their content? How do you see Facebook growing in that direction? And then also for Michael, for Oculus, um, how do you see Oculus playing out in the realm of education? And what are your, any plans in that direction for that? Education, it, one of the key things about virtual reality is that it creates the ability to put together whatever experiences you want as the technology gets better. So for education, it's easy to look at things like classrooms where people can come together from all over. They can all sit in front of the teacher. They can all feel like they're getting individualized attention. You really, it's like the matrix clip. You get to bend and break those rules to figure out what actually works well. And there's already some research that's been done in those areas that shows that they really do produce better results, for example, if you put people in the center of the classroom. So the possibilities are huge. Uh, it's not like there's a specific targeted thing. It's, it's more now it's up to educators to figure out how to apply that and invent a whole new way of educating people. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, for your question about publishing, you know, our goal is to give everyone a voice, right? And make it so that people can share whatever content they want in whatever way they want. So we're going to work on publishing tools so that way people can write content on Facebook. We're going to work on tools that make it so that people can share whatever content they create elsewhere or whatever they see elsewhere and can share that with all the people who they want. But I mean, this is the, this is the mission of the company, right? To, to give every person in the world the ability to share as much of what is important to them um, as we can and, and to connect people through that. And I mean, that is going to be something that we're committed to for, for forever, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're here to do, right? I mean, we believe that um, there's this very big shift in the world where, um, you know, if you look back at the, the world in the last hundred years, you know, a lot of society was organized around these big institutions, very hierarchically top down. And I think the internet gives people the ability to change that. Right, and to reorganize a lot of the, the world so that way it's organized from people first, right, and, and our own relationships and, uh, and, and return the power and the voice to, to individuals and to people, um, both in terms of you know, helping people build the relationships that they want and stay connected to the people that they love and care about, uh, helping people create businesses and um, talk to their customers and learn from their customers in, in new ways and personalize their products, um, all the way up to uh, being able to have greater civic discourse and uh, be able to share their opinions and have a voice about all kinds of important topics in the world. But uh, I mean, we're going to be committed to giving people the tools every way that we can to give people the, the full breadth of, of opportunities to engage in that. Well, that's all the time that we have. I want to thank you both for a really immersive experience here. Um, please. <laughs>